Welcome to the 23rd episode of Kabbalistic Mystic, the podcast for the Western seeker, where we explore the tree of life and the ancient Hebrew wisdom as the lost spiritual heritage of the West. I'm your host, Ovadia Batat, and today I want to talk to you about Saturdays, or in Hebrew, Shabbat. Those of you who have been listening to my episode know that when I was growing up, I did not like Shabbat. It was a day that symbolized everything, anything but fun for me. I wasn't able to watch TV. I wasn't able to turn on the light. I was bound by a huge set of rules and regulations, what to do, what not to do. There wasn't even public transportation on Shabbat. I couldn't call my girlfriend. But today, I'm 42 years old. And me and my wife love Shabbat. We've reclaimed it. We claimed it without the religious restrictions that were placed on me as a kid. And yet, when I look back and I reflect, I understand why they were placed. I choose not to practice them because I think that there's a reason why it was skewed that much. And I want to talk about that in this episode. But I found the essence of Shabbat, and I enjoy it, and I want to share it with you today. One more thing before we begin. I'm about to launch a new podcast called Seven Fat Cows, The Art of Dream Interpretation Through the Lens of Kabbalah. In every episode, I'm going to be interpreting dreams sent to me by you, the listeners. Yeah, go ahead, send me your dreams, and we'll see where that goes. Seven Fat Cows. All right, let's go back to our topic today, Shabbat. Let's begin. It is Friday morning. I get up and like any other day, first I write. But once I'm done writing, I go down to the kitchen and I start cooking. I make bread, just like my grandma used to make for, still does actually, for over 60 years. And I cook something, some kind of a dish. It's my turn to cook. My wife and I share the load. She cooks once a week. I cook once a week. And I do it on Fridays. I clean what I can clean. I prep all the good things I want to eat. And at some point in the afternoon where, when after I cleaned everything I could clean and cooked everything I wanted to cook and shaved and, uh, you know, kind of just did everything that I needed to do, including going to the store, nothing is left on my list in terms of something that needs to be done the next couple of days. I go upstairs and I shower. I cleanse the entire work a week off myself when I shower. And then I go and I do yoga. And there's a reason I do yoga on Friday afternoons. I do yoga because Shabbat is the body. And I'll explain in a second. And I'm preparing the body for Shabbat. I'm opening the energetic channels because the entire point of Shabbat is that we are open to accept the feminine, to accept the connection to the divine by creating a union between the masculine and the feminine. Here's the idea. The entire week we work, we provide for ourselves, we do everything that needs to be done in order to live in this world. We get up in the morning, we go to work, we take care of everything that needs to be taken care of, we take care of the kids, we provide for ourselves, we go make money. We live in a world that tangibly is very, very industrious. And we have to, we have to be in this world because otherwise we won't have anything to eat. We have to be firm with two legs on the ground. The fact that we're seekers doesn't mean that we, we don't have a job, and we don't take care of ourselves. We cannot just live in this spiritual realm. We are beings of physicality. But the entire week passes by, and on Shabbat, on the seventh day, we have a chance to rest. 
Now, Kabbalah tells us that this is built in, that everything in the universe was built in sevens. And on the seventh day, the entire concept is that you are naturally, from a rhythmic perspective, rest. Now, that day doesn't necessarily have to be Saturday. That's okay if it's Sunday. It's okay if it's Monday for you. It doesn't really matter. But you do want to celebrate it in a way that's going to be corresponding and jiving with the overall vibration around you. That is, if the entire world is very industrious on Monday, and if you decide that Monday is your Shabbat, from an energetic perspective, you won't quite feel what me and my wife feels on our day of rest. Now, I want to go back to Shabbat and talk about why it's so meaningful. What do we do? What do we not do on Shabbat? First of all, we have no rules. The whole concept of Shabbat is we do whatever the fuck we want. We want to play ping pong, we play ping pong. We want to read a book, we read a book. We want to sleep, we sleep. We want to pleasure the body by eating whatever we want. We eat whatever we want. And we don't do anything we don't feel like it. And naturally, we don't feel like going shopping on Shabbat. We don't feel like running errands. We don't feel like opening the computer and doing any type of work. We sometimes do open the computer, but usually it's going to be for something like watching a movie or playing a piece of music or checking something on YouTube. We have no rules in the sense of what we're allowed to or not allowed to do. Any remnants from the original laws of Judaism, I'm talking about conservative Judaism that prevents you from running any electric device on Shabbat, that's sort of trying to preserve that that sense of understanding of what does it mean in the Bible to say, do not do any work, thou shall not do any work on Shabbat has transformed into a skewed version of reality amongst religious people, at least in my perspective. I once had a visitor here on Shabbat, and he, you know, a a great person, a good friend, and he, you know, he observed Shabbat so strictly, and he really likes to smoke marijuana. And he couldn't do it because you're not allowed to light a fire on Shabbat. And, you know, a friend of mine was sitting across the room and suggested and said, listen, what if I light the pipe for you and all you're going to do is going to inhale? Will that be okay? So the, my friend thought for a minute and said, huh, actually it would. So my friend, you know, he lit the bud and, you know, filled the pipe, the water pipe with smoke and handed it to my friend. And all my friend needed to do because the the fire was already off and, you know, he's not to, allowed to light a fire on Shabbat. All he had to do is just inhale the smoke that was in the pipe. And he got stoned. And he was happy. But in general, he's not allowed to do that because he decided for himself that he's going to observe Shabbat uh, uh, just, just the way the rabbis, the conservative rabbis say that he would from a religious perspective. And therefore, he's not allowed to turn on you know, the lights, because that's creating a a circuit, building a circuit, building something new, that's work considered according to traditional Judaism. And so he is not lighting a fire either. He can't go in a car. And so my friends ask him, listen, we're all going to a club to listen to some live music. Do you want to come? And he says, no, I can't go in a car. You know, so my friend told him, well, I'm driving. Why can't you go in a car? I said, well, you know, it's tricky. You know, I open the door, the light of the car will turn on. You know, I can't close the door because then the light of the car will turn off. So my friend told him, well, what if I opened the car door for you? You'll sit down, I'll close the door. And then we drive there and I'll come out, I'll open the door for you, I'll take you in, I'll pay for I'll do everything that you're not allowed to do. Now, my friend is not Jewish. And according to traditional Judaism, if it's not Jewish, that if, if I would have said it to my friend, he would have said no, because your sin is my sin, because you're Jewish. So by obligation, you're required to do whatever I do. But because my friend is not Jewish, um, 
that is the friend who suggested my religious friend to do all these things, then my religious friend said, okay, I'll do it. And he actually came with us to a club and listened to music on Friday night, which is, which is the evening of Shabbat. Now I'm telling you all this so that you'll understand how skewed the reality, at least in my opinion, in terms of what Shabbat became over the years. Now, I'm not trying in any way, shape, or form to undermine the way religious people absorb Shabbat. Observe, that is. I was confused between the two. Absorb, observe. My parents do it. They don't light. Um, they don't turn on a light on Shabbat. They, they, they don't use the gas to, to heat up food. They have like a hot plate that they use. Very strict rules. And I respect that. But to me, that does not work. To me, the essence of Shabbat is not that. To me, that is a residue of something that was there years and years ago and has skewed to be an obsessive compulsive behavior that is rooted in the sense that somebody has to tell you what to do in any given moment. And there is an association with the concept of Shabbat with anything that is not the olden days, what it used to be. And there's this, oh, how should we call it? Sort of like skewed sense of adjusting to modern life in all kind of roundabout ways. So for example, in Israel, every average religious home will have what we call is Sha'on Shabbat. It's a Shabbat clock. It automatically turns on the lights and turns them off. Right? Somebody who smokes cannot smoke on Shabbat, so they're cranky the entire day. The whole concept of Shabbat is to enjoy, to pleasure the body. If you're a smoker and you can't smoke on Shabbat, what's the point? If you have to go around, you know, beat around the bush and, and somehow, you know, create a situation where you, so you, you eat food that is cold because you're not allowed to heat it up because you forgot to turn on the hot plate, you're missing the concept of Shabbat. Shabbat is about resting. It's about one day that you don't think about anything that is bothering you that you don't think about how to make money, that you don't think about how to, you know, advance your career or getting more listeners to your podcast or, you know, what's the next chapter in the book you want to write. Shabbat is the one day that you have prepped for because it's your day. It says in Hebrew, Lishmo Shabbat. Lishmo is to keep, to preserve, to secure I consider myself Shomer Shabbat because I secure that time for myself. That's why I'm preparing. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Because once my wife and I did this a few times, we fell in love with this practice. There is something about the concept of knowing that you have one day, full 24 hours, starting from Friday afternoon until Saturday evening, knowing that you have that full day, that you don't have to do a thing that is yours, that you can sleep for 24 hours if you wanted to. There's something about it that is so magical, and I cannot explain to you enough how great it is, because it has changed our lives, not just on that day, but throughout the entire week. The way we approach work has changed. Because we know we have our day. And so in the middle of the week, we suddenly are motivated to do everything that we need to do. We just have energy. First of all, we rested. We had a day that we just spent doing whatever we wanted. And for me, I find that naturally I gravitate towards sleeping a lot, at least during Shabbat day. Second, we have a day that is our play day. It's sort of like if you divide the psyche into the inner child and the inner adult. We live in a world where the inner adult is constantly hammering the inner child. 
Oh my God, what do I have to do? I have to get up to work. I have to go do this. I have to do that. I have to feed the kids. Oh, did everybody brush their teeth? Did I do this? Did I do that? How much money did I make? How much money did I have? Oh, I have to go to Costco. There's so much that I got to do. There's so much that I got to take care of. I get no rest. And my inner adult is hammering my inner child every time it's trying to be like, okay, just leave me alone. I want a few moments. I want to go play. If I'm going to go in the park and play frisbee with friends, I'm looking at my clock. I'm like, oh, can I do it? Can I not do it? Where do I need to be? Is my wife need me somewhere? There's always this constant energetic vibe that there's something I have to do. Having a day when that, where that does not exist is unbelievable. It is allowing every cell in my system to rest. So in the beginning, we just kind of, well, I started really. My wife sort of, it took her a little bit of time to pick up. She's not Jewish. She grew up Catholic. Her Sunday was usually the, you know, the restful day. But eventually she kind of joined me. And once she did it, it was just a whole different story. And slowly and steadily over the weeks, we started realizing that we're really looking forward to Shabbat, that we're starting to prep for it, and that it's becoming our favorite day, and yet it is improving the entire week for us. Now, this restful thing, you know, in my own tradition where I came from, if somebody came and stayed with me, they would be horrified from the things I do on Shabbat. I watch movies, I... You know, I I drive. If I want to go somewhere, I drive. That is a big no-no in traditional Judaism. And even to me, as I celebrate Shabbat, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost like there's this inner notion that, oh, but I'm not doing it right. It, is, it was so entrenched in me growing up what Shabbat's supposed to be like that I literally feel like it took me over 30 years to shed that residue, to shed it completely so I can actually reclaim Shabbat and enjoy it. Now, Shabbat is not just amazing from the perspective that you give yourself a rest. And that is in itself really, really amazing. I mean, you're going to start doing that if you choose to. You're going to realize that slowly and steadily, when somebody around you start talking about money, about business, about, oh, what do I need to do on, on Monday? You're going to start hearing that person and it's, it's just not going to vibe well with you. You're going to feel that from a vibratory level, from an energetic level. It's just not something you want to hear. You're going to cherish the fact that you get up in the morning and you think to yourself, wow, I can do whatever I want. I can stay in bed. I can get up and take my time and eat a nice meal, then go back to bed. Ooh, I want to watch a movie in the middle of the day. Ooh, I want to go for a walk with my family. The entire family is going together, doing something fun. Every Saturday, me, my wife, and the two dogs, we go on a hike. So all that's really, really important. All that's great. And you're going to really enjoy that. It's going to become a part of your life. It's going to transform your week. 
it's going to transform your life because you're suddenly going to feel that for some weird reason that is unexplained, you are actually vibing with an inner rhythm that you didn't even know exist. Because Kabbalah tells us that Shabbat, that the seventh day, the day of rest, is built in to everything in nature. It's a part of you, whether you like it or not. If you are living in a way that seven days a week, you are doing nothing but the same. That is, even in the day that you're not going to work, you are taking care of everything that needs to be taken care of, and you're running around, and you're going to buy stuff. And yes, maybe you give yourself an hour, but overall, it's just like another day that you just do shit. Then you're living in a way that is not vibrating and not jiving with your inner rhythm. We have a tree, we have an apple tree outside. And we bought it when it was like maybe three years old. It's been about four years, seventh year come, not a single flowering bud on the tree. No apples. We have plenty of apples the previous year. It's called in Hebrew, Shemitah. It's a year in which some trees just don't give fruit. It's a year in which the, the tree gets to rest. And so there's all these religious rules around Shemitah, around Shabbat. But what is the actual concept? Why is it that there is a seventh day in which we get to rest, that there's a seventh year in which we get to rest? Why, what, what, what's so important about seven? What is the spiritual meaning of Shabbat? I want to talk to you about that. I want to explain to you why Shabbat is so important for your psycho-spiritual journey, not just from a physical perspective. And we'll do that in a minute. <laughs> שאביו אל תוך רי אל בית אמי ואל חדרי אל מידתי. הנך יפה רעייתי ושפתותי חודשני שינייך לבנות כמו אור הלבנה מי זאת עולה מן המדבר מארץ רחוקה נישאת על כנף ציפון גדולה הגיעה לביתי. הנך יפה רעייתי אני נגנב משתנה ששרפות אותי כאש על העבר, מי זאת עולה מן המדבר, מארץ רחוקה, נישאת על כנף ציפור גדולה, הגיעה לביתי. Everything in the universe was built in sevens. In our body we have seven energy centers. The lower one, the red, then the orange one. They're called chakras in the east, we all know that. Then the third is the yellow, then the green, then the blue. than the indigo, than the violet. Now, we've been told in esoteric teachings, like, for example, the raw material and some other um, very important esoteric teachings, that the seventh chakra, the crown chakra, is not really a chakra we can ever work on. It is not a chakra that we can open. It's not an energy channel that we can do anything about. In a sense, it is the sum of all other chakras. It is the opening, it is the aggregate value, if you will, of all the others. So the more we open our other chakras, our other energy centers, the more the crown chakra will represent that in terms of the color that it projects in our aura. Now the same is true with the Hebrew letters. that are divided into, well, they can be divided in many different ways, but one of the ways that can, they can be divided is the letter Aleph comes first, and then three sets of seven, because there's 22 letters total. So you've got one aside that is sort of the reflection of all the other letters as uh, archetypes of your consciousness and your spiritual development. And then three sets of seven. The first one represents the mind. It's seven letters that represent the structure of your consciousness, the structure of your mind. The second seven 
letter, a set of seven letters, represents your body. It's essentially representing the seven laws of consciousness that operate in the physical world. And the last set of seven letters represents the seven stages of enlightenment. Now, in all these sets of seven, we're told that the last letter in each set, that is the letter Chet in the first set, the letter Samech in the second set, and the letter Taf in the third set, are not really representing yet another piece of your consciousness. They're not really representing yet another law of the universe, just like the other laws. They're not a letter that represents another stage of enlightenment, but rather a summary of all the other six. So the letter Chet, for example, represents essentially a reflection of your consciousness, of your mind, as it stands, it's the chariot card in tarot. Now, if you have evolved your consciousness to the optimal level, you are controlling that chariot. And notice that the chariot, if you look at a tarot card, and I highly recommend looking at the tarot, the the uh, the Rider Wade uh, deck, which is extremely unique. But I'm not going to go into it right now. You're going to see that the chariot has two different lions that are driving it, one masculine and one feminine, one black and one white. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in a second when we talk about Shabbat. Now the letter Samech, which is the letter that's concluding the second set of letters, that is the laws of the universe that operate in the physical world, is essentially representing the law of verification. The law of verification says that no matter what you are doing with your higher self, no matter what lesson you have learned from your higher self, your higher self will always come back and test you. So your reflection in this universe, in this world, that your physicality is a function of all these six rules, and your higher self will keep testing you on what you thought you have learned or what you apparently have learned. That's the law of verification. So essentially, he's testing you for the way you embody and living by these six rules. And we'll dedicate an episode for these six rules as well. i got to write down all the episodes I'm promising you that I'm going to do. But I actually do. I have a list somewhere. Um, the last letter, the letter tough, is the seventh letter in the um, stages of enlightenment. And it is a stage in itself, just like the um, the law of verification is somewhat of a law in itself. Everything is being tested. But in a sense, it's not really. It's the aggregate. It's your world. If you are still stuck in the devil card, which is the first stage of enlightenment, the letter Ayn, which means I, evil I, hence the term, then that's what your life is going to look like. That's going to be your world. You're going to be consumed by desire. You're going to be following desire. You might not be suffering. You might not know you're suffering. You'll have to go to the next step, the ego disillusion, to even realize sometimes that you're suffering. But that's your world. That's the aggregate response that you get from the universe to your actions. And if you pass all stages of enlightenment, you literally get the world. Every card in tarot, every letter in the Hebrew alphabet, every one of these 22 archetypes have a lower value and a higher value. The lower value is who you are right now, the unawakened being. The higher value is the enlightened being, the who you can be. If you strive and work hard. And so we see that there's a pattern There is some kind of a summary, an aggregate combination of all that exists in sets of sevens. And that's the same is true for Shabbat. The concept is that in in the in the physical world, everything is a reflection of the spiritual. And just like we were built, and there's an inner rhythm, innate rhythm to us, that we work for six days and then we rest. 
And that rhythm is the same in the entire world. So is that rhythm reflected in the days of the week. Now let's see it in a more aggregate perspective. We are facing what's called in Hebrew, according to Kabbalah, the thousand years of the feminine. According to Judaism, the world was created 5,777 years ago. Now that doesn't really mean that the entire world was created. It just means that the Garden of Eden was created. The world, according to the Bible, was created. But there's interpretation to that and what that means. And we'll touch upon that some other time. But the point is that the story that we're living, and we are living a story, whether we want it or not, we are living a prophecy, we're living, we're living something that happened, and that is happening, and that will happen. But the skeleton of it was already determined. We have free will in terms of what part we're going to play in it. But it has happened, hence all the doomsday prophecies. We are approaching a crescendo in a fight between evil and good. But I'm digressing here. The point is that we're accessing what's called the seven, the thousand years of the feminine. The entire cycle that we're living is a 7,000 year cycle. And we've lived almost 6,000. So we're ending the sixth year of the masculine. Now, what is the masculine according to Kabbalah and what is the feminine? And it's the same as the six days of the week and the seventh day that is the feminine. The masculine is the conscious mind. It's the mind that thinks, it's the one that does, it's the one that guides, that says, I want X and I'm going to do X. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go to work, I'm going to make money, I'm going to do what I'm doing on my psycho-spiritual path, I'm going to go to a psychologist, I'm going to resolve my primal wound, I'm going to be a better father, I'm going to be a better mother, I'm going to be a better person, I'm going to be a better citizen. I'm going to be a person who is dedicated to a goal. I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I have a desire and I'm going to go after it. That is the conscious mind. That is the masculine piece of our consciousness. The feminine piece of our consciousness is our subconscious. It's a she because it's the feminine side of our consciousness. She knows everything. She's connected to a higher self. She knows our true desire. She knows what we're here for. She knows what lessons we have to learn. She controls the involuntary organs in our body. We control the voluntary ones because we have free will. We're the man. The man decides. Whether you're a woman or a man in a woman's body, it does not matter. The physical vessel is nothing but a physical vessel. When it comes to your consciousness, you're, you're an androgynous being. You're both masculine and feminine. Go back to previous episodes to hone that idea because this is so important. Let go of the label, the first label that you got when you got out of the womb. It's a boy. It's a girl. It is nothing but your exterior. Now, you are skewed to one side of consciousness, no doubt. Women are different than men. There's, there's an innate desire to be taken care of for women. There's an innate desire to take care of, to give for men. And there's a lot of other stuff. But at the end of the day, when it comes to our consciousness, we all operate in the exact same way. Our conscious mind wants something and has free will and operates the voluntary organs, that is our hands, our feet, the involuntary organs, the liver, the spleen, the heart, and many more are operated by her, by the subconscious. And she decides what she's going to do and how she's going to do it. And when you're not walking in the path of your higher self, when you're not really truly listening to it, at some point she will intervene and she will show you a dis-ease that is a disease. And everything she does is metaphoric. Everything. In fact, the entire physical world is the feminine. Just like your body is the temple of your soul, the world is the temple of your body. I like to say that the body is the temple of the soul 
Our home is the temple of our body. Our city is the temple of our home. Our country is the temple of our city. And the world is the temple of our country. But it's not who we are. It's just the temple. We want to make it beautiful. One of the mitzvot, of the commandments of Jews, is to build the temple. But that temple is a metaphor In the human body, in order to reach enlightenment, it is the body. The body is your temple. It's everything physical is feminine. Because your entire universe, you're living in a five sensory illusion. It's a little bit of a hard concept to understand, but once you get it, suddenly everything falls into place. You have an aha moment. Everything you experience, everything you look at right now, you're looking at your phone through which you're listening to this, maybe your eyes are closed, maybe you're driving in a car, Everything you see in the physical world is manifested by your subconscious, by the feminine portion of your consciousness. You are not looking outside. You're looking in into your consciousness. You're looking inside. Everything in the physical world, everything in the universe, in the known universe that you know is reversed. It's an illusion. The things that is further away from your essence is your skin. The thing that is the closest to you is the source of all creation. In religion, it's called God. We're going to call it the original light, the original spark, the letter Yod in Hebrew. Elohim. Adonai. Now, Adonai means your higher self, really. Your higher self is you in a different vibration, in a vibration that doesn't really follow the laws of time and space like we know it. And it helps you design your incarnation. And you come here into the illusion and your entire world manifests by your subconscious, which is the individualized part of the superconscious feminine called in Christianity the Holy Ghost. Your entire goal in your psycho-spiritual journey is to create a union between the Holy Ghost and the Father, that is Adonai, that is your higher self. You are the Prince. You are the Son. They're the Holy Trinity. Now, what is Shabbat? Shabbat is a symbol for that feminine, for that feminine part in you, for the day in which that union can happen. It's the day in which you're letting go of all the conscious thoughts of your conscious mind that wants something. And what you're doing instead is you're pleasuring and resting the body. You're taking care of the physical needs. That's why resting in Shabbat Shabbat is so good. You feel that you're resting. Oh my God, it's the day of rest. And it's so good. It feels so great because it's a part of your rhythm. But not only resting is important on Shabbat. On Shabbat, one of the things I'm doing is I'm studying. I love studying on Shabbat. There's something about the the combination between the masculine and the feminine that when I study on Shabbat, I understand the information on a whole different level. It's like the gates of knowledge are open on Shabbat. Now, it's not that I don't study during the week, but the studying is more industrious. It's more like, ooh, I need to know this for this podcast, or I need to know this for my book, or I really want to study more about astrology or about this or about that. So I take the book and I study. But on Shabbat, when I pick up the book, there's a different feel to it. It's almost, I usually, first of all, on Shabbat, I, I don't plan what I'm going to read. I just pick up a book that for some reason I I jive with. Usually it's very, very um, uh, cryptic books of Kabbalah. Like, for example, for now, I uh, right now I study a book called Shari Tzedek, uh, The Gates of Righteousness, um, which is also from the word tzaddik, which is a righteous man, uh, an enlightened man in Hebrew. Tzaddik in Hebrew is is like the Buddha in Buddhism or like the Jesus, the Christ consciousness in Christianity. Sha'aret Tzaddik. It was written by a rabbi called Rabbi Yosef Jiktila in the 13th century. Unbelievable book. He explains the 
um, the way the Hebrew language uh, is built into the tree of life, uh, the structure of the Merkava, which is the, the chariot. Merkava is a chariot. And he explains how your body is the chariot. It is your temple. And on Shabbat, going back to Shabbat, the whole point is to make it a ritual. Shabbat is a metaphor. Remember, the, the feminine only speaks in metaphors. And this entire world is a metaphor. Every part of you is a metaphor. The way your hands are shaped. Remember, she creates them. She creates your body. She is your body. And so the way your hands are shaped, the way your legs are shaped, the way your, how big your nails are, the color of your hair, the way it is, the way it behaves. All the parts that you were born with that are part of your DNA are a representation, a metaphor for pieces in your psyche. The way you have chosen together with your higher self to reincarnate in terms of the uniqueness of your own personality. Things that are related to sickness or health, things that are related to things that change. Oh, maybe your nails are dry. Maybe you have uh, an aching in your lower back. All these things are a metaphor for things that are happening right now on your cycle spiritual journey. And everything that is happening to your body is a representation and a metaphor for something that is happening on your cycle spiritual journey. That's how Kabbalistic yoga works. We find out what areas in our body are tight or not open enough. And we equate that to the tree of life, to one of the, the 12 abundance pipe. And then we know which section we have to evolve in our own consciousness. Because remember, the whole concept of the tree of life, Kabbalah, it's the opposite from the East. The East works the body in order to transform the mind. In the West, we transform the body by transforming our own consciousness, which is mental. And so going back to Shabbat, Shabbat is the body. Don't make it so literal. If you make it literal, you're still in your male side of your consciousness. If you make it too logical, oh, I'm not allowed to do work on Shabbat, so am I allowed to turn this on? Am I allowed to go to the store? Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? Make it a ritual. A ritual is never, never something that is accurate. And so my wife and I make it a ritual. After we shower, after we cook, we, we come together, we light the candle, the Shabbat candles, we say the prayers, we bless the bread, and we immediately feel relaxed. And then, ritualistically, we call in everything that Shabbat stands for. We call in the amazing knowledge that is coming to us as we read on Shabbat. It's never a normal experience when we read on Shabbat. We call in the ease and the restfulness and the pleasuring of the body. We call in this connection, this divine connection between the masculine and the feminine. When I do yoga on Shabbat, not just the yoga I prep for Shabbat, but when I do yoga on Shabbat, it is very different than yoga I do in the middle of the week. I feel it. I feel the union between the masculine and the feminine. I feel the energetic channel opening. I feel something different in me. I love Shabbat now. I love it because... It's a part of me. I celebrate a piece of my own psyche. I celebrate the fact that there is a feminine part of my own consciousness that is waiting achingly to join in union with my masculine side. And every week that is passing by, every week in which I celebrate it, is helping me on my psycho-spiritual journey, every week I get closer to my goal. Small steps. But I do, I feel it. And that is because I am working in the rhythm that I was created in. Now many of you cannot fathom the notion of taking a whole day and resting in it. 
my wife and I do not have kids. And I don't want to be presumptuous to even think what it means to have kids and to have chores and to have, to have you know, a uh, job that you need. Some of you might be working on Shabbat because you don't have a choice because you have to provide for your family. And I want to acknowledge that. And that's okay. But remember, it's a ritual. Do something. Do something that every week, regularly, you are setting that time for yourself. If you cannot do 24 hours, do an hour. Do two hours. Do an evening. Do half an hour. Every Friday night for half an hour, disconnect for everything. Turn off your phone. Make sure that nobody can reach you. And do something that you love. If you love to, 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 to smoke pot and smoke your joint and just rest and chill out. If you like to play basketball, go play your basketball. Do something once a week that you know is yours and nobody can touch. That you are serving an inner calling, an inner desire that is so a part of you that nobody can take it away from you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. And do it ritualistically. Lighting a fire, lighting a light, lighting a candle is very important because the concept in Judaism is that Shabbat is essentially the light. The light comes in into the darkness. We live here in this illusion. It's the dark side. It's the side that very little light is available and we have to find it within. Versus the other side, time space, that the light is so abundant, but we cannot do any work because there's no physicality, there's no movement in space. And Shabbat is about the light coming in and flooding us. Now the, 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 the custom is that the woman lights the candle on Shabbat. Only the woman can bring the Shabbat, accept the Shabbat, welcome the Shabbat in Judaism. Now think of the metaphor of that. Only the woman. The woman in Kabbalah is your subconscious. In the Hebrew letters, it's called Dalet, which means door. She is the door to the divine. She knows. She's connected. If you ritualistically Every week, acknowledge her presence. Call her in. Light the candle that is a part of your own spark of consciousness, the cosmic spark that was given to you. If you do, do that consciously and mindfully every week, you will get to know her. You will know Shabbat in you. Shabbat in Hebrew means to seize. Reaching the pinnacle of our psycho spiritual journey to seize all work because we have done the work. That is the metaphor, my friends, of the story of creation in the Bible. It is all a metaphor. It is not to be taken literally. In some ways it is, but in some ways it is not. Just like everything in creation, there's a literal meaning and there is a metaphoric meaning. God created the universe in six days according to the Hebrew Bible. It is because in the seventh day, the seventh chakra, the seventh vibration, that's the vibration where no more work is done. We are told in esoteric teaching that there are seven densities of existence in time space that is outside of our physical universe. We are in space time where there's three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. That's the illusion in time space where there's three dimensions of time and one dimension of space, that is, that is there's no movement. We are told there's seven densities. The eighth one is back to the beginning of the octave. That is God. Now the seven densities are structured. And we're not going to go into them right now. We're going to go into them when we talk about wanderers. But the point is that the seventh densities 
your higher self is in the sixth density. That is an extremely evolved being, mind, body, spirit complex. You right now are in third density. And this planet has just moved into fourth density. You're still in third. It's a process. But the concept is that in seventh density, there is no work. Even your, it, it is a vibration, it is a density that is higher even than your higher self. There is no more work. The work has been completed, seized. Celebrate Shabbat. It is the pinnacle of your psycho-spiritual work. And I say celebrate. I don't say observe, oh, observe, observe, oh, what, what other word can I use? Don't say, don't follow the law. It's not about laws. I say celebrate because it needs to be fun. It needs to be a celebration. A celebration of the part in, the, in you that is divine. The feminine part of our psyche. And if you're a woman, distinguish that from your femininity, from your physical femininity. Understand that you have a subconscious that is feminine and that your entire conscious existence is a reflection of your conscious mind, which is your masculine side of your consciousness. So that, my friend, is Shabbat. <laughs> Every time I go to Israel now, I celebrate Shabbat like I used to when I was a kid. At least when I'm in my parents' house or in my grandmother's house. And I do it out of respect. But now that I know what Shabbat is, I no longer have the resentment and the pushback. I follow the rules out of respect. Not because I have to, but because I want to. And when I leave their house, when I leave my parents' house, when I leave my grandmother's house, I go back to celebrating Shabbat the way I want to. And I've realized that the reason why I don't feel frustrated, that I don't feel resentful to these rules, is because I get Shabbat from myself. I realize that what happened was that Shabbat was taken away from me in the shape of the obsessive compulsive rules. It was given to me only in a way that it just did not resonate with me. And now that I've reclaimed it, now that, I, that, that I, I, I'm no longer missing it, I no longer care about the rules. And I'm okay celebrating them. I'm okay following them when I'm in my parents' house, when I'm in my grandmother's house. So with me taking Shabbat on, enjoying it, learning to celebrate it, I've resolved a piece of my own psyche, of my own consciousness, a resentment, uh, uh, something, something um, not pleasant that was in me all these years. And it was because until a few months ago, I did not have Shabbat. And that's how we are on our psycho-spiritual journey. Everything we resent manifests as some kind of a disturbance, some kind of an imbalance in our lives. And understanding and bringing it back to order helps us to not resent it anymore. And to understand the people who have put it in place. My mom always used to tell me, I love Shabbat. I love Shabbat. And I used to say, oh, I hate Shabbat. The deep connection that I have with my mother right now, without her even knowing, just because I've learned to love Shabbat, is beyond words. I feel like I know my mother more than I've ever known her. Because now, when I reflect and when I think about her sitting 
on Shabbat on the couch reading the newspaper or just closing her eyes and falling asleep. Even though that she fell asleep in the light because the Shabbat clock did not turn it off yet. And back then it bothered me. Oh my God, she has to sleep in the light. Now that I reflect back on that, I know that in her heart, she was basking in the joy of Shabbat. She was loving it. She was loving every moment. And all she wanted for me was to love it too. This is it for today. We touched on the importance of Shabbat, why it's so important to the Jewish people and to other traditions too, like the Seventh-day Evangelist. We spoke about what Shabbat stands for, its uh, spiritual meaning, the union between the masculine and the feminine, a celebration of the feminine, the subconscious, the door in us that is opening us to the divine, that union, the purpose of the psycho-spiritual journey, the union between the masculine and the feminine. Find a way to celebrate it. If not a day a week, a moment a week, find your inner rhythm. And if you can allow yourself to celebrate it, start slow. Learn your rhythm, learn what you want to do. Invest in food, prepping it. Invest in cleaning, cleaning your body, cleaning your home. Prep yourself for Shabbat. See what that feels like. Do it a few times. See if you like it. And if you do, after a few months, I want to hear from you. I want to hear how it changed your life. It changed mine. It changed my wife's life. From Spokane, Washington, this is Ovadia Batat. Wishing you love in every moment. Thank you for listening. And Shabbat Shalom. you heard today was by an Israeli artist called Idan Reichel and the song is called Hinach Yafa, You Are Beautiful and it's from a Jewish prayer that is sung before Shabbat comes in thank you thank you thank you thank you <laughs>